thanks for joining tonight. Uh, we're, we're actually pretty good on uh, on time right now. So uh, this was this was something I was really excited to kind of finally put together. Brent and I were originally talking about doing a live stream, um, just him and I, of basically doing a a live review of um, the uh, Broken Barrel um, uh, pro um, uh, products. So, and then fortunately, I reached out to Seth, and I wasn't expecting to get anything back as quickly as I did, and he had some time, and uh, so I appreciate him taking a, a few minutes, a few minutes of his time tonight. So, uh, looking forward to kind of going through some of these very like unique and and different whiskeys, and I'll have Seth explain it a little bit more in terms of you know what kind of goes into it and the broken barrel name and and all of that. So. Um, but, uh, first what I want to do is, um, I'll have Brent go ahead and kind of introduce himself and, uh, tell a little bit about his channel and, uh, we'll kind of go from there. My name is Brent and I have a whiskey review channel called the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Reviews. It's been through a lot of changes in the last probably four months. So if you have checked out the channel before, it's totally different now. It's just me. When we first started it, there was three of us. Just me now, not doing part to any kind of bad vibes or anything like that. It's just life situations. It's a totally different different atmosphere. Just got a new set done. It's just a different thing. So if you have checked out the channel before, go ahead and check it out again if you like. And uh, I just put up this video on um, how to create an infinity bottle. I'm giving away three free samples on that. If, you, if you'd like to get in on that, I will be doing the drawing on Thursday. So if you do want to get on, get in on that, try to get in there before Wednesday and get your answer in the chat. But I am going to give away three samples on that. Scott, thank you so much, man, for having me on the channel tonight. Yes, thanks, thanks, for, thanks, for joining, thanks for joining tonight. So I appreciate that. So, and then um, obviously my uh, next guest is uh, Seth, the, I guess we'll say owner, um, of the uh, a broken barrel whiskey. So, uh, Seth, thanks for joining me tonight. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, thank you for having me on. I uh, I appreciate you guys having me here and let me be here. So, yeah, Cheers. so we're uh, yeah we're really we're really excited to kind of get into the whiskeys. But um, I'd say before we do that, uh, Seth, do you want to kind of tell everybody maybe a little bit about yourself and uh, the company itself? Give a little bit background on on that. Of course, yeah. Um, I started the company in 2012. I was uh, working out of my grandmother's garage, so we've come a long way. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have been successful thus far. But yeah, it's been a really cool journey. Um, we started with vodka. We moved into whiskey in 2017 with our first uh, batch of Broken Barrel. At the time, it was actually called Infused Spirits. And then we slowly, over the first year and a half, decided to make Broken Barrel its own brand. And since that decision has come to life, we've really been able to explore new ideas, new concepts, really go deeper and deeper into the idea of what oak does to whiskey and really drive that point home a lot more than what I think a lot of people are doing with mash bills. So for us, it's a lot more about oak. And that's where we came up with the oak bill, which will be on every bottle of everything we produce in 2020. So very cool, very exciting. It's a um, it's a cool brand. We've got all of our stuff being made right now in Owensboro, Kentucky. And uh, if you haven't been there, it's the OZ Tyler Distillery out in Kentucky. They do have some of their own brands. They do contract with a number of other brands. They used to have uh, Chicken Cock, The Duke, um, a couple other you know well well known household name bourbons and rye products. So. Uh, if you're out in LA or California, you'll see Quarter Horse at all the Bevmo stores. That's also one of their brands. I've got a couple of bottles of that back there behind me. But yeah, I mean, I like some of their stuff that they're doing. Um, but what I really like is that they're a pretty new distillery. They came out in 2014 with their first barrels. And so their stuff's just hitting that four year mark. They're going to just start having a <laughs> product. Um, they do have a nice stock, a pile of. Kentucky straight bourbon that we're going to get to start accessing that they're starting to put out into contract distilling for us and other brands, but they're also very comfortable with the concept of the oak bill. So they're going to let us do all that, you know, crazy, wacky smash barrels, hammers, axes, that whole deal. Uh, and they're getting kind of into it. And I'm going to go out there uh, and see them in February at the end of the month. And we're going to make our newest product, which is called California Oak. 
and that's going to be a Central Coast Cabernet Barrel bourbon. So very interesting. Well, that was that was one of the things when I started kind of looking into the the kind of the the background of of what you guys were doing. It was very it was already very different. I mean, we all get so focused on the mash bill, but you know, what I, what I thought was really cool was just the fact that you guys were really focusing on not only the, the whiskey part of it, but how you were kind of doing the finishing aspect and really how you were going about doing the finishing, you know, part of it with the broken down barrels and, and kind of adding them a bit like, like a stave. I would, I would say it, you know, if I had to interpret what it was, it was, it'd be very much like what makers does with 46 or something like that similar. Um, but, but what I like really about what you were doing was the, the different finishes that were, that were there. So that was, that was really cool. So I'm, I'm guessing that's something with your company that you're going to be very, I guess, kind of focused on trying to, trying to do different like infusions or different finishing. Yeah. I think the biggest difference between us and makers and the makers 46, and I've recently gotten to try some of their, um, their, they have a private select barrel. Uh, and they actually have on the back the different check boxes of what oaks they use. But for me, it's really not just about picking and selecting oaks for the custom retailers. Um, the, the other cool part about this is, yes, like what you said, the oaks we're using. So getting wine barrels and bringing those into the fold, getting uh, Mizunara or getting some of these other more rare and exotic oaks, and then not only treating them if we need to, but also using them. And that's what you're going to see more and more from us in 2020. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the Oak Bill is also using all of them at the same time. And unlike Maker's Mark, our baseline has three oaks in it. Our baseline 95 proof bourbon, our baseline 105 proof heresy rye, and our 116 proof cast strength uh, broken barrel bourbon. All three of those have uh, that, that Oak Bill of 40% French, 40% ex bourbon and 20% uh, sherry gas. And we found that it's this really beautiful combination that gives you all those kind of woody, oaky characters, that sherry fruit on the end, and that really gritty sort of home of bourbon. Yeah. So, so let me, let me back up a little bit. What with, with all of this kind of like infusion and, and blending and, and finishing, what, what was it that kind of got you to where we are right now with, with the company? Um, well, what, what started it all was I wanted to make whiskey and everything was always under the lens of or the framework of infusions because we were an infusion company and we were doing uh, the vodka and the bitters and it was like, okay, you have to put something into something else, let it sit there and let it add flavor and character. And when it came to bourbon, it was about figuring out what oaks are going to impart what flavors. But when I realized that it was cool uh, to kind of combine these different woods and see how different flavors would evolve when all three oaks were sitting in the whiskey at the same time, same temperature, same time of year, environment, all that heat, moisture, those components played really, really interestingly into the difference between emptying a barrel and I was drinking a lot of those double barrel bourbons and, and second fill sherry cask um, or bourbon cask scotches because I'm really big in the scotch as well. And so as those different things were going on, we would, um, we would notice that when you do it all at once, it's totally different ball game than when you have a really hot year or a really cold year and you have a lot of time passing. And also using younger whiskeys was really interesting because you would actually get a lot more flavor effect uh, from using the oak for just a short period of time versus adding oak to something that's been aging and aging, aging in the same oak for five, 10, 15, 20 years, which again, we weren't messing around with too much 20 year old stuff, but we did get some 12 year old samples and some 10 year old samples. And when we tried it, the effects were a lot more muted versus using younger whiskey, which had a lot more flavor to be added. The canvas wasn't covered, so to speak. So with, um, I guess with the, I guess the definition of, of whiskey. So I guess since we're kind of saying that I'm assuming that everything that you're, that you're blending or using is not all necessarily uh bourbon. So this could be either, 
corn whiskey, light whiskey, bourbon, all of those different things, are they all kind of in play? Say, uh, sorry, say that last question one more time. So, so like with, with it just being defined as, as whiskey, I'm assuming you're using other things besides bourbon. So whether it's light whiskey or corn whiskey, yeah. things like that. Well, in the single low series that we're going to try tonight, a hundred percent. Yes. In fact, there's no bourbon involved in the single Oak series with, uh, the stuff we're doing straight out of OZ Tyler, that is all straight from the barrel into the tank, whiskey staves, uh, wine staves, mise en -are staves, whatever we're using, those all go into the tank straight from uh, the barrel tank, oak goes in. Okay, all right. So, and then I guess with that being said, so the finishing part of it is the, the whiskey is loaded into whether it's steel tanks or whatever it may be, and then you infuse those the whiskey that's there in those those you know whiskey container or those containers and you add the oak to those exactly yeah so we'll take you know i brought a couple examples um so you guys can see so this is a wine stave um this is one of the cabernet ones that we're using so we look for wine staves that have a nice bleed level in there um you can almost see some of the sparkling and crystals those are the tartrates of the wine that's sort of the crystallized flavor that we're looking to get off of the stave. And when you put a full stave into the whiskey, you got to remember, you know, whiskey, you can see where it's in contact. The, the whiskey was not in contact here with the oak. Sorry, the wine. Uh, let me let me say it again. The wine was not in contact here. As you can see, it's, it's just the oak, regular oak color. You can see very clearly where the wine had made contact with the oak. So... That whole idea is when you put the full stave in, you're getting the back, you're getting the sides, you're getting the tops, bottoms, all that interaction is going on. Um, so it's really a different way of looking at surface area. And you, we talk about surface area, you have people that are using 15 gallon barrels, 25 gallon barrels, 30 gallon, you know, all these different sizes because they're trying to increase the flavor or decrease the time and really have different types of things. Uh, going on with terms of flavor and aging. Uh, this is a scotch barrel. You can see just the difference how dark this is, both on the inside and outside. So this is a Lafroy barrel that we used for that Isle of Pete you guys are about to taste. Well, um, and I think I think the other the other, like you said, the other interesting aspect to that is um is once you start breaking those up or cutting them in half, you're now exposing multiple sides rather exactly. than just you know so i think you are you're you are really i mean the true essence of infusing something you're getting a lot more contact of the barrel into the whiskey from that standpoint yeah. now this is the mizunara stave i wanted to show you guys real quick you notice it's untreated we basically got it straight from japan we specified don't make barrels with it send us the mizunara whole punch so we can actually string it up and we lower these in and then we actually pull them out with the string there's a great video on infusedspirits.com. So if you go to our, our parent company website and you go to infusedspirits.com, you can actually see uh, it's a two minute video flat and you can watch and kind of learn about how we've done the things we've done. Yeah, cool, cool. Well, I, I think it's a very, a very fascinating, interesting, uh, you know, process. So thank, thanks for sharing some of that. So why don't we, um, why don't we kind of get into the important part? Why don't we, uh, we'll start kind of diving into some of the, uh, the whiskeys and see what, uh, See what we think. I'm gonna start with the uh, the Mizunara first, okay? And I kind of uh, I kind of busted it back out. I, I I had opened these bottles. Oh, geez, it was a little while ago. And then last night I kind of got back into them, and I started kind of just nosing it, letting it. Now that it kind of opened up from the sample a little bit, and I was getting some really really interesting profiles. The the Mizunara, um, and I guess while we're kind of going through that, do you want to, Seth, do you want to explain a little bit maybe about like what what this one is specifically? Um, mainly you have a four-year-old Kentucky, uh, sorry, four-year-old Indiana corn whiskey, second fill barrels, can't call it bourbon, and a five-year-old uh, Kentucky corn whiskey, also second fill barrel, can't call it bourbon. Um, I felt like with the second fill, we still had, even though they were four and five year old, there was still plenty of room to stretch the flavor out and add that extra element of uh, what I feel like Mizunara has to offer, which is really soft, small notes 
I drink a ton of Japanese whiskey, and one of my favorite things about it is that it's really not ever out of balance. It's really an enjoyable experience from start to, to middle to finish. The mouth feels really got to be a, a little bit more on like the sweeter side um, in terms of being just not too strong, not too overpowering to, it's something you, you, you want to be able to drink this while eating food and have yeah. a balance harmony and that's what i tried to go for at mizunara the cool part was i wanted to do it with corn um you know a lot of uh japanese whiskeys do use malted barley as their mash bill um, and they import uh, malt from scotland so i thought that the ability to put uh, mizunara with corn whiskey was a pretty different approach a very american you know east meets west sure, sort of uh, sure, uh, sure. So. yeah no i i think it's a now now, Brent, for you, what are you getting? Uh, what do you get on the nose? Like for me, it was very citrusy. Like it was green apple pear, like right away. So yeah, I'm getting a little bit of the corn aspect to it. Um, you uh, with Japanese whiskey, in my experience, um, like like you said, the Misner oak is is soft, subtle, approachable. It does have a little bit of like a on the finish on like your Misner oak that has in your Japanese whiskey has a little bit of a tinge to it. I was wondering if you use the the corn also to um, help balance it out, due in part to the fact we are in America and you're not making a Japanese whiskey. Was that you use that just to be your best bet to kind of um, level this out to where it wasn't one directional? Well, I had I had actually gotten in uh, raw whiskey, wheat whiskey, single malt whiskey, and corn whiskey, as well as, you know, tried some of these oaks with our bourbon and our rye that we were already getting from Ozzy Tyler. And the immediate, like, findings from just initial chopping up some staves and doing mason jar samples, which is kind of how we start the process, and I'll go grab one in a minute and show you guys since we're here at my office so I can go grab anything I need. Um, but immediately we noticed uh, peat and corn did not go together. And Mizunara and corn went really well together. So we kind of, once we had some of those first tastings with the, with the company and all the employees came in and we would like sit there and try them all, we, we noticed immediately like, okay, certain things are working and certain things aren't. So let's, let's go deeper and further into the things that are really starting to evolve in a way that we like in terms of mouthfeel, finish, flavor, let's look at proof and let's play with that a little bit and see what we like. Um, and we found pretty quickly that we were very intrigued by Mizunara's, uh, that there's something about new oak and corn that goes really well. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting nose. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely citrus and like a, like a, a green apple. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely get that. Like some, like pear I got. And then the more, the more for me, as it opened up, I started getting more like a, like a white pepper, not so intense, like black pepper, but more of like a, a white pepper type of, of note to it. That, that's like the, the, the Mizanera Oak is so, it's so different. It really, really is. It, and on the palate, you'll definitely, it, you'll definitely be able to see it. It's, it's soft and subtle, but um, it does have a little bit of a, of, of a spiciness to it on the finish of most Mizanera Oak. Japanese whiskeys that I've dealt with. This is definitely a different, interesting nose. Yeah. Have, anyway, you, noticed, yeah. have you noticed any? I, I noticed how you had the staves. Um, do you? How do you think having the dried out stave versus like I know like in um, some of your finished whiskeys like your Jeffersons and your the Macallan they go through a strict barrel picking sure. process. And they they they're they're checking these barrels and they're wet, they're damp. They're, do you think the dried out stave plays a plays a big role or a different role in, in the whiskey and the whiskey you're producing? hundred percent. We've gotten in like really, really wet in staves. I've got some ruby port in the back that was literally I call it bleeding, but it was it was dripping off, um, and it was so wet that when you put it into the whiskey. By the time you actually made that uh, made that infusion or maceration in the in the jars, it was like pouring wine into the whiskey. It was a very challenging uh, 
thing to overcome. So drying out the staves is actually a very important part of the process. There's even We've even experimented with uh, sweating the staves. So taking dry staves and actually uh, in Nevada, where we were originally doing this before we partnered up with Ozzy Tyler and we were buying in bulk back in like 2017, we would lay the staves out on pallets, throw a plastic tarp over it, and it's 120 something degrees outside. We throw a bucket of water underneath it and it would kind of moisturize and, and sweat the oak out. And then we would take those kind of moist to the touch oaks and put them back in because we felt like the dryness was a problem. And we found that that wasn't our best batch. I think it was batch two, not my favorite batch of our bourbon. Uh, and, and again, with that said, each batch of our 95 proof or cast strength, there are variations. You line them up and taste them through. There's a through line, but there's also variation between batches. Right. Um, this big conglomerate company that's able to put out the exact, exact, exact same time. We're not, you know, it's not like a sourdough thing where we're taking a little bit from each batch and putting it in the next one, so to speak. Um, but yeah, no, it's really kind of a fascinating thing, the whole journey of creating these batches and treating the oaks and, you know, doing different things with them. So yeah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be really interesting being able to kind of experiment like that. You've got a lot of things kind of at your fingertips, it sounds like. So yeah, it's been, it's been a, uh, very, very fun time experimenting with the different oaks and the way you can treat them. So, yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's try, uh, let's get into this one. Cheers guys. Cheers. And I like the Musin R for cocktails as well. I think it's actually at a price point at 49 bucks, uh, MSRP that you can take it and actually do some very fun cocktails here at our office. We actually do a torch and we take, so we do uh, old fashions with each of the three, different uh, single oak series whiskeys. So we'll actually take a piece of Mizunara, torch that, put the glass over it, let the Mizunara smoke be a part of the Mizunara old fashioned. Same thing with the Isle of Pete, with the uh, Lafroy cask and the Sherry cask for the Amontillado. And it's really, really fun to have a cocktail where the oak used to make the whiskey is also being used to make the cocktail. And yeah. that collaboration is really cool. You, you, can, you can see where I think using really any three of these to make a, a different or craft cocktail, you can really do some, probably some amazing things with some of this stuff. Yeah. This yeah, is I, I, I really, I mean, I really like the balance of the, you know, you still get the corn whiskey aspect more for me on the palate than I do the nose, but then, but then that Mizunara really kind of kicks in, mellows it out, kind of gives it a, a smooth characteristic. And then I think for me, like I get a lot of like pear. There's a lot of pear that comes out in this for me. So um, it drinks what I would, when I first tried it, my first thought was this drinks like a scotch minus the malted barley part. I know that sounds weird, but I wasn't because malted barley can be such a dominant grain, but I was getting the the floral aspect of, of this that a lot of people get with, with scotch. So it's, it's very, very unique. I, I like it. It's definitely different and unique. The corn aspect is there, especially on the front of the palate. Mid palate, it does. It got a little bit of a citrus aspect, maybe like an apple or a green apple or a pear, and it kind of finishes off. It, the mizzenier oak is getting caught in the finish. It it's a hundred proof. It. It's drinking like a hundred proof whiskey, but very yeah. nice. Got a nice little finish. Um, yeah. It's very different. It's 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 to uh, to me. It's it's not like a Japanese whiskey at all. To say, no, you know, it, and I, well, see, I, I think that's the I think that's the thing because with with Scotch and a lot of the Japanese whiskeys with that with that malted barley, it's such a dominant grain that I think for me. Um, a lot of other things kind of get lost, you know, in, in that a little bit, but I can see really where the balance of this corn whiskey and the Mizunara really have kind of, you know, blended and mellowed together, like really, really well. I'm there, there's a, there's a candy sweetness to it as well. It's very sweet. I've know? got like a little bit of like a butterscotch, but that, that yeah. Mizunara oak is uh, definitely sitting on the palate now. Um, I like Japanese whiskey. I really, yeah. really like it. Uh, and this one to me was one of the one. This one in the uh, 
a Monotillo, a Monotillo cast. I hope I said that properly. It was probably my faves. Um, but the, it, it's it's definitely different. It's it's to to put it in a category. I don't think you really could. It's not a it's not a Japanese whiskey. It's not a bourbon. It's not a corn whiskey. It, it technically is a corn whiskey, but it doesn't drink like a corn whiskey. You can definitely tell the influence from the Mizunero, um I staves in in the barrels. Yeah, yeah. There's no, there, there's no, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, if this was just straight up corn whiskey, I mean, it would be much, much rougher around the edges and in your face. And I mean. Corn whiskey to me is always kind of like a, a buttered corn on the cob anyway. So, I mean, if that's what you want, but I think the Mizunara really, really did a lot of wonders with this. It smoothed it right out and gave it some fantastic character. So um, that's, the main, that's the main thing I would say from the process, the Oakville and all that is smoothening out sort of the harshies of the younger whiskey and also at the same time contributing flavor is sort of the main benefit that we've seen from uh doing this whole thing for the past three years and like you said i mean yeah it's not quite japanese whiskey it's not quite corn whiskey for a japanese whiskey drinker looking to get into bourbons or a bourbon whiskey drinker getting into japanese whiskey this kind of can be uh, a platform to transition and taste yeah. what two hybrid things and i think it's very different than like what, what Beam put out with the, uh, I always butcher the name, whether it's Legend or Legion or whatever. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's not even in the, I it's like that. the same ballpark. Um, I've had it, it's fine. It actually is a very similar bottle to our, our Broken Barrel with the uh, the larger cork, but the that one just drinks like most of their other uh, bourbons, quite frankly, and it doesn't, I don't find whatever Japanese influence they were going for, I don't think that bottle really, you know, hit that target in a way that I thought this one sort of did. So I, I, I'm, I was very surprisingly happy with this one. I thought it was going to be my least favorite of the three when we finally tasted, you know, after they had matured and the oak bills had settled in and the color had really settled in and we knew that they were ready to go to bottling. Um, I was convinced that this would be my least favorite simply because I had my heart set out on the other two and I've done several tastings now, and this has actually come back as most people's favorites. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed. It. I mean, really from the get go. I mean, I I really enjoyed it. I didn't have any expectations, um, you know, going into it. So I was very just intrigued by by what it was, and and pleasantly surprised, um, really with with all three. We'll kind of get into the the other ones a little bit, but I, I think so far with with uh, the Mizanara. Uh, it's a it's a really really nice whiskey, and I think at a pretty good price. What did you say it was? Fifty bucks MSRP. Yeah, the concept was to be able, you know, you, you go out and you try and find these rare bottles like Elmer and this and that. I've even seen like some of the high west stuff go up as high as 100, 120, 140 bucks in some of the secondary, you know, areas where it's hard to find. Yippee Kaye or Burai, or, you know, they should be 70, 80 bucks on the shelf, give or take. But they they go up, they go up, they go up. And the idea for these, though they are limited edition, was that they would be available 50, 50, 50. So if you were gonna drop a buck 50, you could actually collect the entire series and come back to it and actually have a nice experience, taste with family, friends, that whole thing. So the idea was always about making these things accessible. That's our most expensive product too, is $49. So we go down at $39 for cast strength bourbon, 116 proof. We understand it's young, we're not trying to overcharge, we're not, thinking that just because we're craft we're entitled to overcharge because our costs are higher than maybe it might cost a beam or a buffalo trace or someone else to put out a bourbon we you know we don't have to uh play that game and so our margins are very low and we put a product out that we feel is really affordable yeah well and that's that's kudos to you guys because i mean that's there's a lot of people like you are very well aware, aware of that you know they'd charge 80, 100 bucks for these things. And, you know, I think it, I think it sours, I think it sours a lot of people just because they don't want to, they don't want to pay that, that kind of money. But um, we had a question before from, um, from Dan. So Dan also has a whiskey review channel. Um, and he was asking you, Seth, uh, what are some of your favorite tasting notes in bourbon and scotch? I think he was just trying to get at like your profile. Like, what are you, what, what's your influence in, in some of this? 
<sighs> so many of the scotches I buy are either cast strength, sherry cask matured, or uh, peated. So, and my favorite bottle that I've got right now is a long row. I'll actually show you. I've got a beautiful, beautiful long row. Um, it's peated, cast strength, and sherry cask matured. So it's all three of those in a, in a bottle. But this one here, I don't know if you the can red. see this. Yep. Yeah, this is the 14 year peated cast strength sherry cask. So it's got all the elements I'm looking for in a scotch in one bottle. And then in terms of bourbon, I mean, some of my favorite bourbons, I'm a big Heaven Hill fan and a big Wild Turkey fan, quite frankly. Um, I think turkey gives you a lot of bang for your buck. It's not incredibly hard to find almost anything they make. Uh, you can kind of see right here above my head, I've got all four of my master's keeps. Um, you know, I, I, I drink that stuff quite, quite often. Uh, tasting notes that I look for in bourbon, I want to know. I want to know what I'm drinking. You know, I don't like a bourbon under 45. percent I think really Elmer T sets the bar for me. It's sort of like the best tasting 45 percenter. And personally, I'm not a huge weeder fan, so I don't really. I, I don't buy into the whole Weller hype thing. I got a couple bottles behind me, but I paid 28 dollars for them. I'm not going to go crazy and spend dollars <laughs> yeah. for Weller. Yeah. Like some well, I'm not going to drive around town trying to find it, but yeah. um, I've got a really healthy collection of uh, all the 1792s. I'm a big fan of what they're doing. Yeah, I like that. They, I feel like they've done for um, for Mashville what I want to do with Oakville. Explore those worlds to no end. You know, sweet re, high rye, full proof. You know, they're toggling all the levers that they know to toggle as kind of a heritage brand. Whereas I'm kind of trying to find a whole new box of all new levers and toggle those levers rather than go and put my hand on a lever that's got 17 other hands on it. And yeah. go, oh, I'm cast strength or I'm this or I'm that. Like, no, let's use sherry and French oak at the same time on a bourbon and go that route. So yeah. I want to pull other levers in really odd, crazy rays. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think the, uh, uh, the cliff notes is that you kind of like something bold, spicy with a little bit of sweetness and stuff to it. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, yeah. A, yeah. And I, I'm a, I'm a fan, I'm a fan of 1792 as well. I, I like a lot of what they do their that profile that it has. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of them as well. So, um, all right. So why don't we, uh, why don't we move on to, um, the cask of Amontillado? I said that correctly. Yes. Amontillado. Yeah. Okay. Not a lot of don't don't pronounce those L's. Amontillado. Yeah this this for this for me this was like my favorite one without kind of letting the cat out of the bag. For me this was like I really enjoyed this. So this this for me started to be become like um, very like chocolatey cherry dark fruits all of that that like right up front something I look for you know in a lot of cast strain kind of bourbons. This is barley, by the way, my dog. Barley. All right. Interesting. Cool. Cool. And the, art, the artwork on the bottles is cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is the same artwork that is, that is on the, the full-size bottles. But it is. It is pretty cool. Uh, do you want to, I guess for anybody watching now and then later on, um, Seth, do you want to let people know kind of like what the, what the mash bill, like what this is kind of comprised of and, and all of that? Yeah. So Amontillado is going to be a, uh, our oldest whiskey we've ever uh, had our hands on. We went to MGP and got some of that 12 year old light whiskey that they've got. Um, it's actually the same whiskey that was available for, if, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, um, and this gave me the idea too, was high, and again, I, I've got like a really soft spot for High West, but they've got the uh, light whiskey, the 14 year yep. MGK. So some of the younger stuff they've got, they've got a 10 year, 11 year, 12 year, and some of that's actually coming of age at 13 year. So I've been, keeping my eye on that stuff. And what's really fascinating about light whiskey is that light whiskey's got tons of, of the 
older whiskey notes you look for and something that's been in a barrel for quite some time. But then it's also light in the sense of it's missing some of those core, core flavors that are derived from new charred oak barrels. And because it's missing that, it's willing, or the, I would say the whiskey is really able to receive the amount of flavor and just the right notes from a used wine barrel. So for me, using the Amontillado Sherry, which has really deep, dark uh, red fruit flavors, dark chocolate flavors, some of those characteristics that are a little more robust, those coupled with the fact that you have this uh, high, high corn whiskey that has been sitting in a used barrel for 12 years. I mean, yeah. holy shit, you just put that all together and you've got yourself a little bit of a, of a party going on. Yeah. That was, you know, it was extremely expensive to keep it at the same price as the others. So I did cut it with more of that five-year-old Kentucky corn whiskey as well, because they were both high corn mash bills. They worked really, really well in a blend. So I was able to get those to, um, to work together in, in the uh, blending process. And then we actually had tried the Amontillado on the corn whiskey, the five-year and the 12-year-old, and they both tasted good. So we knew kind of right away that by marrying those together, we would find a really, really good balance. So this one's bottled at 55%, 110 proof. And really this one for me jumps out of the glass the most. Getting like the dark fruits, raisins, some cherries. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's it's really it's really it's really all of that. And I think I mean for me, which is when I first tried it, I tried it without looking at what any of the mash bills or oak bill or any of that stuff was. And I was when I first looked at it and I saw that this was like almost fifty percent, forty five point five percent malted barley. I was I was amazed because a lot of times. Not oh. this one. This one is not the malted barley. Yeah, that's the Isle of Pete. Oh, the, uh, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, okay. This is the ninety. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. So, yeah, this okay. That's what, was, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, boy, I'm like, I'm not getting malted barley on this bad boy. That's why. All right. So this is the ninety five. Yeah, this is the ninety five five. So yeah. I found the malted barley was the hardest whiskey to work with by far. And I just gained such a tremendous amount of respect for all the beautiful scotch that I've had um, getting into this business because man, it malted barley is challenging to, yeah. to finish. You know, I wanted to really come out with something and I had some really cool barrels in mind and you know, I really wanted to bring I feel like I kind of failed in a way because I wanted to bring that peat smoke to a truly American style corn whiskey like I did with the other two. Mm -hmm. And I was not able to do that. And there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of issues that many, many blenders and, and finishing uh, whiskey companies have had in finishing corn whiskey with peat uh, barrels. It's been a huge challenge. Peat smoking bourbons and corn whiskeys is a bitch. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. And even the slightest, uh, you know, discrepancy in your mess in your recipe can fuck the whole thing up pretty badly. I can, I can, I can believe that. I mean, it's a, it's got to be kind of a tricky thing. I mean, it's, it's yeah. already tricky without having to do any of those other things with it. Just trying to get the blends and everything right with, with barley, I'm sure it can be a very, a very difficult thing. So, but. Well, yeah, and you're, you're paving the way. This is, you're doing some things that really hasn't been done and, and you're, you're kind of paving the way and I'm sure there's a huge learning curve and uh, you're probably not going to hit a home run on, on everything. I, I think, I, I think, I think this cask of Amontillado, I, I mean, I really, really, like this i i mean i i already like the fact that you know it's the a 95.5 you know i like that mash bill i like that already but to to then to then you know kind of blend that i mean i think you guys have done a, a really really nice job i mean and with this what is this 110 proof i mean it's yeah. it's it's i like my proof a lot so everything well, it's, it's, it's a 
it, it does have a little astringency on the nose, but it's very approachable for 110 proof um, barrel strength, I guess, whiskey, barrel proof whiskey. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, and, and, and I, I get, I mean, I don't, and I don't get as much of the astringency, um, you know, I don't get like a lot of heavy oak or anything like that right. it's there, but for me, it's a lot of just the, the dark fruits and the, the, the chocolateness that's there. And I, and for me, that translated into the palate as well. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really, a really nice, um, um whiskey that that you did what's up it's raisin it's raisin yeah yeah i can i can i can definitely i can definitely see that i can definitely see any of those those dark fruits the you know and and i think it's i think it's sweet it's almost to the point where um like where a fruit begins to almost kind of like turn or like ripen right. like that where it's very intense and you you get you get a lot of that I'm catching some vanilla also, mm -hmm. some like some vanilla and a nice subtle oak note. Yeah, it does it does dry out, so you start to get some of that like leather tobacco type of of presence and stuff to it as well. Yeah, so really, I mean, the tobacco, the tobacco is actually an interesting Yeah, I mean there's a cigarette almost quality to it that's kind of it's not a super smoky but it's it's more of that tobacco leaf uh, yeah because for me for me that was the the like leather tobacco type of notes for me is is when a whiskey begins to kind of like really dry out and start to feel like it's pulling that moisture out mm -hmm. of your mouth those yeah. those like notes really start to kind of kick in for me especially on higher proof whiskeys um, and especially finished whiskeys, but like my thought was when I was tasting this again the other night, I think this would be really, really good with like a nice medium bodied cigar. I don't know if either one of you smoke cigars or not, but, um, for, for me, for me, I think this would hold up both. I think it would really be, um, very complimentary to, to either one, a nice medium bodied cigar. I think this would be a, a perfect kind of whiskey to have. So. I can see the tobacco in it now, uh, a little, a little bit of tobacco, not so much the leather, but it is very, very nice. Really, it, yeah. It, I like it, the the dark fruits on it to me, kind of it, it reminds me of a, a scotch. Um, the how dense the the fruits are on it. Um, um, very nice and different. Once again. In in I this is a twelve and a five year Kentucky yeah. corn whiskey. All right. The sweetness I think is a bit more like when I taste it, and I'm I'm like you know thinking about the finish now as I taste it, and it, it really does have that almost vermouth like quality on yeah. the back end when you think about like how it sits in the back of the tongue, back of the jaws and gums and all that. It has the viscosity almost of like a vermouth or a sweet um, uh, or, um, alcohol infused wine type of thing, like the sherry, but they're yeah. almost more like vermouth. And then the other thing I, I kind of get is almost like a jasmine flavor uh, in the finish. Mm. Uh, as it just kind of sits there and dissipates, I get a little bit more of that jasmine flavor. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, it well, yeah. does. It, in the, it, it's got a really, really nice finish to it. And, and like how you described for me, it's like right there on the mid into the back of the palate. I mean, it just sits there. I mean, it's, it stays there for a quite some time. I mean, this is a nice, a really, really nice, um, you know, sipping whiskey. And again, if you wanted to make a cocktail with this, you could probably do some amazing things with something like this. Oh yeah. I think this would be beautiful in Manhattan because of that. Mm. Uh, as a rye substitute, I think this would be kind of a cool, you know, with that dark cherry and uh, the vermouth or the Amaro, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be really, really fun to have that sort of red wine punch flavor coming through. So it'd be cool. Yeah. I, I, really I totally made those uh, a dozen times already. So they're very, very good. I can yeah. see this, I, this one I is my favorite that. by far so far. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I think. 
Yeah. I mean, I think this is like, I mean, for, for let's, let's just say, I mean, for people who are, are bourbon drinkers or cast strength bourbon drinkers that like a good finished whiskey. I mean, this really kind of hits all those marks. I mean, it's, it's very, it's just, it really kind of, you know, it, you, you just kind of nailed it with this one. I mean, it's a really, really good, well put together finished, you know, whiskey. So yeah, yeah this, it's like burnt sugar. It's also on the nose. It's, it's all of, I mean, it's, it's all of that. I mean, it's just, there's just so many good, good characteristics to it. It's just, it's one of those ones that you just want to sit down and, and enjoy a nice, good whiskey. This is, this is one of those ones to, um, to go for. And what, what did you say the MSRP on this is? They're all 49. They're all 49. Okay. I mean, that's to me, I mean, this is a really, really good bargain at 50 bucks. I think that's a really good, a really good yeah. bargain right there. Yeah. Now, where are you guys both based out of? Um, Indiana. And I'm, I'm Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I believe we are, these are available for purchase in both those markets too. So probably through like total wine or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen them at total wine. I've actually, I've seen the, um, bourbon. I think you guys put a bourbon out previously. It was like 98 proof or something like that. Some, uh, yeah. 95 proof. I've seen that. This is yeah. This is this is bad. Like it, it, I, the, the the drying out, I think, is due in part to just the uh, the, the 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 sherry um, stage. They, like, most finished whiskeys like that. It dries me out for a little bit. Even my skate when I'm drinking scotch, it dries me out a little bit. But very, this one is very nice. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, it really it really is. I mean, it's a it's a it's a good one. So. For me, for me, the the one I was like most intrigued by was, you know, the Isle of Pete. I mean, it's just for me, I mean, I'm not a huge scotch guy. I wanted to kind of get into it and and see really what this was was gonna be. I, I talked to Brent a little bit before we kind of did the the live and stuff, and he kind of gave me a little bit of a, a description and everything of it. And in talking to even a couple other people who who've had it, I was very intrigued by what what I was going to be getting with, with this one. So, um, uh, so yeah, I was, I was, I was just, I was really, really interested. And when I, when I first, when I first smelled it, um, I mean, of course, right away you get the malted barley, of course you get that. Um, but what I, what I got was not for me necessarily like, like a strong peat, it was more of like a, just like a smoke, like a barbecue type of smoke. There was something that was very like being out back grilling is what I kind of got. I mean, as much of a descriptor as I could give. I'm getting was, like a, like a vanilla, vanilla frosting and butterscotch, like, it's like a cake frosting. Yeah, I can, I can see some of that. Yeah, it's very floral, you know, very scotchy. And I think that's that's kind of a characteristic of, of malted barley anyway, that floral, that soft, kind of like almost like a like a doughiness, like a weeded bourbon, similar from the that softness that it has. And you definitely get some smoke. Like I don't have a lot of experience with peat, and and I know you guys probably have far more than I do. Do you do you get like a strong like peat, peat note? I, me personally, I, I, I on this, this is the one that I I was kind of iffy about. I, as far as like, I'm an avid. I, lo I love Peter Scotch, and it, it did like the medicinal, savory, maritime qualities of a Peter Scotch. This one here, I mean, don't get. I, I'm with all due respect, and I think it, it, you, you you explained this a little bit earlier. Um, it doesn't have that, that pea slap you around, you know, it, it slap you around pea savory in your face, smokiness to it. That, that, that's someone that's really into like your Lafroids, your long rows, your, um, your, bo your Bowmores. It, oh, it's, yeah. it, it, it's not going to have that. It, it, if, if that's what you're looking for. This is it, it, it but it, there, there's a, there is a little bit, I'm getting more of like, not the smoke, but a little bit of maybe the, the brininess, maybe a little yeah. brine, a little saltiness, but it's yep. mostly, um, 
sweetness and um, like a, a, a cake frosting and butterscotches. Yeah, Not butterscotch, yeah. but like a, a, a vanillas and, and, and a cake frosting. Yeah, there's, and there's, there's all that. Smoke and salt there. I'm yeah, the one, salt. the one, the one other thing I always kind of seem to get with malted barley, and especially something that's got a little bit of peat or something that's peated is this like band-aid aspect. I know it's not like the greatest thing to smell, but yeah. I, I always get this, like there's this, this band-aid like smell. And, and I, I, I don't mean like any disrespect. I mean, that goes for anything. That's, that's yeah. all, that's for me, like all peated type of, of scotches. I get this, this band-aid aspect to well, it. Yeah, I think it's like your peated scotch is just, it's, so it's super complex. I mean, it like my wife, she smelled it the other night and she said it smells like a, a we we lived in Florida for a while. It smells like an old boat that's just been sitting there <laughs> vacant for yeah. a long time. It's yeah. definitely complex and interesting yeah. to say the least. I, yeah. But that I, that iodine medicinal burnt rubbers that yeah. you get from like your your little foods especially got that huge medicinal quality to it. Um, I mean, I, if if, if I, you're going into this one looking for that, I don't think you're. I don't think you're going to be. You have to have open mind. It, it, but I don't think that's going to tickle your fancy too much. I think it's very lightly peated, um, and you are getting a little bit of the um, the the. And I, I don't know anything about. Like, I do know in the finishing aspect, the, the, the wetness of the barrels, and that's with solid barrels, not broken up staves. Totally different thing. Um, I don't know know how all that works. I've not studied it that much, but I, I definitely think there's a huge learning curve. And as far as I think someone that didn't know what Pete was could um, – mistake and would, wouldn't know Pete was in this. You, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so, let me, so let me, so let me say something to that. So I, I think that's a good, a good transition is that for, so some, for somebody like me, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big, you know, bourbon rye guy for, for the most part. And, you know, and, and kind of just never got into the scotch part of it. And that's why I was very intrigued by this. So when I first tried it, my first thought was, that this is very, very approachable for somebody who would be looking to somehow maybe be introduced to something that's maybe a little smoky, a little bit of light heat. This would be, I think, a very good like transition rather than trying to shock someone's palate with like a Lafroig or something like that. Right. You know, that that this is this has its place in the market. And I I don't, and I guess you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I don't think this is trying to be like marketed as like a peated scotch, I don't think. Well, no, I mean, none of it's meant to be confused. I mean, people do confuse these. You know, oh, yeah. I'll take these whiskey or I'll take the scotch. And no, 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 they're not scotch. These are not Japanese. These are American whiskeys through and through. Every single drop of whiskey in every single one of these bottles has come from American soil. So that part I do think requires some explanation. Uh, Brett, what you were saying, um, iodine, medicinal qualities, uh, you know, this one, I don't necessarily get the frosting. I don't find it to be as sweet as I would have thought the description you gave from a sweet standpoint would have been more um, applicable to the Mizunara, only in the sense that I, th I thought I find that to be the sweetest of the three. Um, especially considering its alcohol is a little lower, therefore the sugars can, can act out a bit more on the, on the palate. The Isle of Pete, so I'll just, I'll just put it out there that I did win a uh, double gold. We, we, because it has a heavier wheat mash bill, we were able to enter it as a wheat whiskey, not, uh, not a uh, malted barley. And, you know, there, there are, I'm seeing mash bills now on barrels that are available um, for purchase and for, for contracting that are 49% malted barley, 51% corn bourbons. Um, you know, these high barley bourbons, you know, we've seen high rye, high wheat, wheaters, blah, blah, blah. But there's also the, the idea of a barley um, forward, barley heavy 
uh, bourbon. And that would be an interesting thing. I actually have not tried a whiskey quite like that yet myself, though I can see myself this year getting samples of that. So, but on this, on this Isle of Pete, uh, being that it won the double bowl, I think the reason for that was there's a lot to unpack here. There's a, it actually, to me, is by far the most complex of the three in the sense that you're tasting grains that are a little less familiar as front runners. So 50 something percent wheat, 50 or 55 and a half percent wheat, 45 and a half percent malted barley. Those quantities of those grains are very uncommon yeah. stuck together in one bottle. So that blend of using, and the wheat whiskey is an 85, 15, uh, but we did use a substantial amount more of that whiskey. Therefore the ultimate mash bill was that blended mash bill of uh, 55 and a half, 45 and a half, or 44 and a half, 54 and a half, something like that. It's, like, yep. it's called 55, 45 for, for ease. Yeah. So the idea, you know, it's, it's got for me a quality that it, it takes me back to like camping. You go camping, you put the fire out at the end of the night, you wake up the next morning and there's still that sort of smolder smell flavor. Um, I yeah. really, I find this to be kind of like someone that was smoking outside 10 minutes ago and stomped out the cigarette, that kind of thing. It's got that after burn smell of a fire that has gone out yeah. uh, on the nose. And then when you get into the flavor of it, it does have sugar, it does have sweetness, it does have that sort of cereal grain wheat quality that a yeah. lot of people like. And wheat is probably, I would say, uh, what is closest to a sweet corn flavor that you get from a whiskey. After corn, I would say wheat is kind of that other sweet uh, characteristic grain that's going to give you that sugary sort of flavor. So that might be where you're getting some of that frosting or vanilla. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree. I mean, and that was kind of my thought was like initially, like right away, you get that kind of like that smokiness that goes away. And then here comes oh, like the sweet, that sweet oh, smoothness. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah the sm that smoke is like right there. It's like right on the front of the palate hits you right away. So, you know, you know, there's something that's smoky that's there that kind of, that kind of mellows out a little bit. And then that sweetness from the barley and the wheat kind of really start to kind of kick in. And I think that's maybe where like Brent was saying that sweetness kind of kicks in with that's a very unique mash bill. You don't see that very often. So that's a lot of sweetness that's there. This guy goes yeah. by a cow <laughs> Yeah. We look pretty good. You know, cow -ila. Yeah. And I, I, I have like no, no reference for any of that. So I don't know what any of them are, what they, what they taste like or anything. So I'm, I'm guessing cause so. Kalila like, is heavily peated Scotch whiskey. Okay. Well, not heavily. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say heavily peated. It, it's a definitely a peated Scotch, yeah. but there is definitely heavily, heavier peated Scotches than that. Well, on the, on the taste, on the nose, I got that on the taste. I did get a little bit of a smokiness, but I also got that little lingering. I got a little bit of like a maritime quality. Also, I got a little bit, of, but it's still uh, mostly sweetness. But I, I like really intense peated scotch. I told my senses. Um, I do drink heavily peated scotches a lot, but um, it, 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 it seems a, a very sweet, very sweet. To me. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think, I think this is just one of those things where. You, if, if you look at this, so, I mean, for me, this could be, I don't want to see miss, not misleading. I, I think the, what happens is like from a good example is like myself and Brent and, and, and probably you as well, um, Seth, is that with you guys having a, a peated, um, like a sense for heavier peat that I think a lot of people, when they see that they have this expectation in their mind of what that's going to be. And that's why for me, when I saw this, I was like, oh boy, I don't know if this is going to be like my thing. But when I saw the mash bill and then tried it, you can see where this is very approachable for somebody that's starting to get into a peated whiskey, but still with some of that like underlying sweetness that kicks in really early on. So I think this would be a good, like, uh, like a gate, like a gateway type of, um, 
you know, peat, quote unquote, peated scotch or whiskey or whatever you want to call it, that it's got a lot of nice approachable flavors to it. So it's definitely different and interesting to, to say the least. It, 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 I'm, I'm going to say, I, I didn't want any of the, anything I said taken wrongly. I, I'm just being mm -hmm. honest in, in, in it. It is, it, it, and I think um, uh, Seth, when, when Seth explained this before, it, before we even got into this whiskey, he, he, he said it was very hard to do this. Very hard to do this. And, uh, you know, it, it, you're doing something totally different, Seth. Uh, totally different. Uh, and I don't want anything I've said taken wrong. It, it just, as, as, as far as, as, as far as like, it, it like, and the P aspect of it, I mean, it, it's lacking a little bit, you know, I, I mean, but it's, it's definitely a decent pour of whiskey. I, I think, I think that's just one of the, I think that's one of those things where, where somebody who may have, again, that, that scotch or that peated like background or really enjoy that looks at this one way versus somebody like in my shoes looks at it completely different. Like it's just, it's just one of those things where I think that this hits a lot of a lot of those same kind of like marks where it's just a, a fantastic, you know, a, you know, it's kind of a, a nice entry level beginners like scotch type of, you know, peated scotch type of introductory. I mean, it's just one of those things where like, yeah, I would say it's a little smokier than like some of your entry level birth laddie uh like the classic laddie that blue bottle uh scotch you know a peated a peated distillery making unpeated scotch sometimes carries in sometimes yeah. there's that is unpeated this is kind of like that this is yeah, uh it is unpeated scotch but you know, it does have that like you were saying that that even though it's unpeated just doing part of the location it, it does carry that that locations qualities um that's more because it is an unpeated scotch but it does I, I, the, we're not importing peated scotch malt and distilling it here we're not you know like like right Am, Amrut from india or some of the um uh japanese whiskeys will import uh scottish barley scottish grown barley and so that whole idea is not what we're going for here. This was to extract. I mean, you got to think of the journey of the oak. That's kind of the story we're telling here too, which is, okay, so you have a new charred American oak barrel that is that was a bourbon barrel that is done once it's got the barrel, uh, the bourbon taken out of it. That bur the barrel goes all the way over to Scotland, gets filled with scotch, peated scotch, sits, matures, ages, with uh, this very smoky malted barley that the Scots are using the peat to dry out, distill, the actual liquid is what's carrying that smoke. They don't smoke gun the barrel or right. anything like that to get the peat flavor. And for those that don't know, that are watching and don't are not familiar with the peating process or, or um, smoked barley that the Scots use, uh, and that stays in the liquid. So the liquid imparts that flavor into the barrel. The barrel gets used. It's done. We get the barrel back. So now it's gone from America to Scotland, back to America. It's carrying all that smoky flavor from the liquid that was inside of it. And we're re-extracting that back out into a new liquid through the Oakville process. And that kind of concept of like here and there and then back and here, all of that stuff going on is very... Uh, it's it's very exploratory. It's very it's very new, and so we're trying these things, and what you're ending up with is essences of this, essences of that, and it's kind of a fun it's a fun experiment, you know. For whatever reason, the people really loved it. It's not my favorite of the three by any stretch. I'm way more an Amontillado fan. I, I love my sherry cask finished whiskeys, yeah. be it bourbon or rye or you know one of my favorite ryes is the uh, Sherry Finish uh, 1776 uh, James E. Pepper. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. great, it's a great Sherry Finish rye. Love that stuff. And that whole kind of concept, you know, that's some of the, those are some of the whiskeys that got me into this whole world. And yeah. you know, 
I'm trying my hand at them, but with my methodologies. And so the results aren't exactly what you've had and they're not exactly what you're used to, but they're like you were saying, Scott, they're very um, introductory. These whiskeys bring people from one area and hopefully help them go to the next. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, I think what you guys are doing is, is just the the process of what you're doing, I think is very, is very cool and, and different. And I can see where having all of these different, you know, Oak bills will allow you to really, you know, try some really different, you know, different blends, you know, putting different Oaks and different finishes together and, and kind of going through the, the trials and tribulations of, of, of exploring what works and, and what doesn't. And, and to me, to me, like I, I said to like kind of somebody not long ago that I think 2020 that we're going to really start to see um, more of a focus be put on the wood itself. Um, and because there's only, there's only so many types of finishes and things you can do with, with bourbon or, or whiskeys, rise, whatever it may be. But I think the different flavors that you can um, kind of pull from from the wood and different kinds of woods, I think is going to be a very kind of transitional type of thing. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of, you know, trying different things, these different, you know, oak bills or just different woods, different barrels, whatever it may be. So, so I think what you guys are doing is is very is very cool and and a and a really a really neat idea. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're a little bit, uh, we're a little bit over, over an hour. Or so um, I guess with that being said, so thanks everybody for, for joining tonight. Um, before we go, um, uh, Brent, do you want to kind of tell everybody a little bit uh, about your channel again? Yeah. My name's Brent. I have a whiskey review channel called the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Reviews. Check it out. I am doing a giveaway this Saturday, but you have to be entered before before Thursday, Thursday afternoon, and we'll do the drawing, see who wins. It's on the Infinity Bottle video that I did. Check that out if you like. I thank everybody for watching. Scott, once again, thank you so much, man, for having me on the channel. Seth, dude, thank you so much, man, for sending the samples. Pleasure to, to go through these with you, man. Good time. Yeah, no, this, was, this was good. I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad you took a little bit of time and uh, and kind of came on with us to to do some of this. And I guess before we go, Seth, you want to kind of tell everybody a little bit, uh, a little more about uh, where they can find you, a little bit about the company, and 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 kind of go from there. Yeah, we're uh, for the whiskey side of the world. We are available in over 40 states now. The whiskey is a little less. Uh, accessible than our vodkas and uh, bitters because they've been out uh, less time and so the rye is starting to pick up and all that. The the big ones for people living in Arizona, people living in uh, Missouri, we're going to be in Walmart in Missouri, we're going to be in uh, Schnucks which is a 20 something location grocery store chain out in Arizona or sorry in Missouri as well. Uh, Total Wines across the country does carry our bourbon. They'll soon be carrying our rye. Uh, some of those great bottle shops, you can always follow us at, um, at Broken Barrel Whiskey on Instagram or email us. My email, you just email me at info at infusedspirits.com. Uh, any of those will help you find, get in touch with us. DM awesome. us on Instagram. We'll, we always get back to everybody. So. Awesome. Thanks for, thanks for joining. And, uh, everybody, thanks for, uh, for cool. joining tonight. I'm, uh, uh, grateful for everybody joining tonight and, uh, thanks to, uh, to Brent and Seth for joining me tonight. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see everybody back, uh, next Tuesday and, um, to everybody out there. Cheers. Have a great rest of your night. Cheers, everybody. Take care guys. All right. We're off. Oh,